Before we move on to solving the larger problem of comparing model types, I wanted to talk about a statistical uh, issue. I'm going to frame this in, in the form of the charlatan problem. The, the idea here is, uh, suppose I want to uh, make a choice about uh, whether or not to hire a, a stockbroker. And the question is, what's a good algorithm for making this choice empirically? We'll ignore all other uh, factors here. So one possibility is that we uh, hand the stockbroker a set of stocks and ask that broker to um, make a, a prediction about what the outcome uh, of these stocks will be in the next week. And in particular, we'll just make this a binary decision. Will the stock uh, go up or down at the end of the week? Then once, once the end of the week arrives, then we can compare what the broker said against what actually happened in reality. So this is also a, a binary question. So, so how do we evaluate this uh, st statistically? So what a statistician would say is that we have a null hypothesis and that null hypothesis is that the stockbroker actually doesn't know what they're doing. So, so this person is a charlatan and there are a lot of those out there. Uh, and, uh, and say this broker is just going to make choices based on a coin flip. And we'll make an assumption that uh, P is uh, one half here. We're also going to make a naive assumption here that the true probability of going up or down uh, is, is also 0.5. And, and under these assumptions, how well do we expect the broker to, to do uh, in any one prediction? And the answer is that under this assumption, uh, that uh, any one guess the charlatan will, will uh, get it correct half of the time. So how about with N stocks? What's, what's the expected number of uh, stocks that the broker will have uh, gotten correct? And the answer in this case is that the, 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 the broker will, will make uh, half of them, uh, half of the guesses uh, correct. Uh, at least that's the expectation. Are, are there other possible outcomes uh, of this? And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, so for example, uh, n over 2 minus 1 and n over 2 plus 1, uh, these are equally likely with, with one another and have a reasonable probability uh, of, of being a, a true outcome, as well as n over 2. Uh, we can also look at n over 2 plus 2 and n over 2 plus 3. And these actually have a real practical probability of, of happening. However, that probability is going to drop off as we get further and further away from n over 2. So the question to you is, uh, as, as we start to make n larger and larger, what does this distribution look like? And, and the answer is that uh, this distribution actually tends towards a Gaussian with a mean of n over 2. And, and in fact, uh, the central limit theorem, uh, what it says is that the sum or, or mean of n samples of any distribution tends towards a Gaussian distribution uh, as n gets large. And this is true no matter what the source distribution really is. And uh, empirically, uh, n, n equals 30, you, for all intents and purposes, the, uh, the, the, the sum uh, or the mean will fall along Gaussian distribution. And, and as it turns out, uh, in practice, n of 20 uh, gets you pretty arbitrarily close to, to a Gaussian. So the question is, uh, after we do this experiment, how do we make a decision as to whether or not to hire this, uh, this stockbroker? And the, the observation from uh, what we've already talked about is, is that uh, un under the uh, null hypothesis assumption, the probability of the stockbroker actually getting many guesses uh, correct is actually relatively small. And, and so we can take advantage of, of this in making our decision. So let's look at that uh, distribution. So along the horizontal axis here, this is the uh, this is the number uh, correct, and the vertical axis we can think of this as a likelihood or a probability uh, or a probability. Um, 
in reality, this is a discrete decision. So these are true probabilities, but when n gets large, we're, we can approximate the distribution with a Gaussian, which, which is a continuous distribution. So I'm going to draw this as a Gaussian. So the likelihood looks something like this and starts to asymptote. Um, this distribution actually is, it's a Gaussian, so it is centered despite my drawing. And the mean of this distribution sits right at n over two. Now, if the, if the broker gives us an answer, a, a set of answers that scores say a little bit higher than n over two, then we can't really tell the difference between whether or not the stock broker knows what they're doing or whether they're just making random guesses. However, if we push the, uh, the, this, uh, this observation out, say, out to this region here, or this point here, then we start to get to a point where, the, uh, where this is a really unlikely scenario under the neural hypothesis. So, so in particular, the formal way to talk about this is um, we ask the question of, uh, what is the probability of, under the null hypothesis, of getting to this point here or higher? So that involves us integrating this whole region here. And, and this is kind of a longish tail, the way I've drawn this. In, in reality, it'll cut off a little bit quicker. Um, but this is what we refer to as, as P. This is our P value. So, so to state that precisely, then um, the, the P value is the probability under the null hypothesis that we will see this particular value or higher. And, and of course, there's a two-tailed definition as well. We won't worry about that here. Now, if this P value is, is relatively small, and in particular, P, if P is less than, than uh, alpha, um, then what we're going to do is uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So alpha here is a, is a small number, 0.05 is a typical uh, choice. Uh, and what we mean by rejecting the null hypothesis is that uh, we're, we're, going to, uh, we're going to declare that, uh, that this assumption that we've made that the stockbroker is a charlatan is not a correct uh, assumption. However, uh, we, although we are making this claim, there is still this probability P that we've done this incorrectly. So, so what statisticians will tell you is that P is the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. So probability of making an error in concluding that the stockbroker is uh, not a charlatan. We, we do also have a notion, so this alpha, itself is also a probability. And, uh, and we can also ask, how far can we get from the, the right-hand side here uh, toward the, the left before the integral reaches alpha? And that, uh, that I'm going to draw in um, here. So, so that, um, in, in our particular case, I'm making an assumption that uh, that our test statistic, the, the number that the charlatan got right, or that the stockbroker got right, uh, falls in this, uh, in this uh, rejecting, rejection region. But this, uh, this point here that corresponds to the, the integral from here to, off to the right-hand side of being equal to alpha, this is what we refer to as the critical value. And so if we were interviewing uh, a stockbroker or testing a stockbroker or a set of stockbrokers, stock uh, once we can compute this critical value given alpha, we can just check the, their number correct against this critical value to make a decision as to whether or not to, uh, to hire them. Okay, so we, uh, we've hit all of these, uh, these ideas here uh, of p-value, alpha va value, and uh, critical value. 
uh, in this case, our critical value is in terms of the units that, uh, that the stockbroker got correct. How we choose an alpha really depends on the kind of domain that we're operating in. As I said before, it's typical for us to make a choice of uh, 5%. If we're in scenarios where we have very little data and we really need to just make some preliminary conclusions, we might be willing to push alpha up to 10%. Uh, but in those scenarios, uh, people will argue about that and for good reason. When we're actually trying to make life and death kinds of decisions, uh, we prefer this alpha to be down in the 1% to 0.1% kind of range or, or even better. Hopefully you're recognizing all of this as just hypothesis testing from your stats class. And, and how this relates to our, uh, our comparison of one model versus another model uh, is that uh, we're going to make an assumption that there's no difference in how the two models perform. And, uh, and then, we, then we'll measure their performance across not uh, a single validation set, but a set of validation sets. And then ask how likely it is that, we've, that, that we should achieve under this null hypothesis assumption uh, this particular set of observations. And if, if the probability of this event is uh, too small, then we'll reject the uh, assumption and then make a conclusion that there is actually a practical, uh, there is a statistical difference between uh, these two models. Whether or not there's a practical difference, that's a, a different question. So, so to keep in mind, this process is not a perfect process. Uh, so even if a model is not better than its competitor, it can look good with some small probability. The saving grace is that we can uh, control this probability by adjusting that alpha, uh, th that alpha uh, term. All right, so th this is uh, our approach to dealing with a single charlatan. And, and you can kind of think of our models as, as being charlatans. Um, next up, we want to actually ask the question, not of one charlatan, but of a whole bunch of charlatans.